Let me just start. Um, my name is Frank Kalicek. Um Really, really happy to be here. Um, always nice to speak with uh, some people with a similar mindset, I think. And I have to say also very nice to travel again after COVID. <laughs> it's also nice. Um, so I'm a, a computer guy, IT guy for my whole life. Studied computer science um, in Tübingen in Germany um, since, it's really crazy, since 25 years. 24 years, I'm involved in open source. Um, so remember, like um, when I first saw our first beta version of KDE um, in 1996, um, I was really blown away um, that this is a software which is done by volunteers over the internet, not really by a company, as a completely distributed fun project, and it's still something that looks and feels similar to Windows 95 which was really big at the time. <laughs> um, and since then I'm, I'm an open source guy. Um, really get involved in the, in the KDE project, uh, where I was uh, for many, many years. Um, did all kinds of things, uh, was a board member, and did, did yeah, other things. Um, also involved in other open source projects, but I'll cut it short here a little bit. Um, since then I um, was an invited expert at the W3C, um, where I was involved in uh, specifying um, some protocols, specifically the activity path, which is this distributed social networking uh, protocol. Um, I'm involved in the, in the Open Forum Europe uh, in project or organization, which is like a lobbying organization for open source at the European level. Um, I helped a little bit the United Nations to um, work on their open source strategy, um, advisor. Um, but I'm probably invited here today um, as the founder of Nextcloud. Um, so Nextcloud is, um, I will show you a lot more about it later, but it's really a software um, which is, um, has the goal to decentralize the internet again. It was really my idea, I started all of that in 2010, like 11 years ago, um, when you could already see that a lot of people are putting their files and data into Dropbox and Google services and it became clear that all the data and information of the whole world will be in the future stored by like five companies. And this is a bit uh, was scary to me and I wanted to build like an, an alternative which is obviously open source but also um, something that you can really host yourself and it's then distributed and can work together in a federated way similar way as like email and IRC and FTP, the web is federated and distributed and I thought it's a good thing to also have this for cloud and collaboration communication software. And that's the whole, the whole purpose of, of Nextcloud. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about open source and about the importance of it for digital sovereignty, but I guess that's something that's already um, widely known, but I still want to go into it a little bit because it's the motivation behind all of it. Then give you a bit of an Nextcloud overview. Um, I hope it's not too long. <laughs> um, and then a little bit of our Nextcloud community, how everything works here, and then questions. Talking about questions, by the way, I don't really feel comfortable with like doing a, like a front presentation to you for for an hour. So please always interrupt me if you're interested in something. And in this group, I think it would be nice to just have a little bit of a more of a discussion, and not so much like a. PowerPoint massacre here for now. <laughs> so please always let's interrupt or ask questions or add something. This would be nice. Um, so digital sovereignty and open source. Um, I, I don't know how it is here in Norway, but digital sovereignty is a term that is like really used a lot uh, by politicians nowadays, which I found find very interesting. Because the idea of it is that you should be in control of your data and your IT and your applications and everything around it. And that's of course something that the open source and free software community um, basically had for many, many years. But somehow open source and free software didn't resonate with like, normal people or politicians too much. Um, but nowadays that we call it digital sovereignty, people understand, ah, I want to be in control of things. And this is why this is like used a lot nowadays. Um, 
there's a definition for it. I looked this up. Uh, digital sovereignty uh, or cyber sovereignty is the degree of control an individual organization or government has over the data they generate and work with at local or online platforms. Um, that's of course in the old days, right before the cloud, this was obvious. You have some kind of computer, your personal computer, your server or something, and it's sitting somewhere. Um, and you run like free software on it, open source, um, some applications, and then obviously you have control of it because you have the hardware, you have the software, you have the data, it's on the local hard disk, and everything is fine and easy. But nowadays that we have this distributed world where everything is in the cloud, um, and the cloud is cool, everybody likes them, the cloud is nice, and then we store everything in the cloud without understanding that we give away like control about everything. Not only the data, but also the applications that run on top of the data. And we just become from a we just become a customer basically of a service instead of really being something who is able to do something with it. And this comes with some risks, obviously. Um, I have some collected here. The first is like loss of control over data represented a strategic risk for our society, individuals, business and governments are surveilled and the data is monetized by foreign corporations. It can also be corporations inside a company, that's really the point. <coughs> they basically give that like, control away to someone who you don't really know what's, what's going on, what's behind it. And this is for privacy and surveillance um, has a lot of consequences. The second is uh, when um, societal debates take place on platforms owned by corporations and hosts in countries with a vested interest, how can we trust the results? This is something that is debated nowadays a lot in the example of Facebook and other social networking platforms who are somehow moderating or hosting debates, like conversations between citizens or kind of countries. But then, um, of course, um, the question is if there's an interest behind it, and there is a commercial interest behind it, because they want to sell like advertising. Um, so this is all a bit of a an interesting uh, question if this is still like uh, good for our societies. Then, uh, when nearly all commerce flows through a few selected platforms, these platforms control the pieces and capture most value. I mean, this is the example of, um, I don't know how it is in Norway, but in Germany, the, everybody buys things at Amazon. Um, yeah, nothing, <laughs> especially during the pandemic, right? It's very convenient. Um, but of course, the question is, is this a good future? What happens with the local um, 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 shops, the hope, uh, local manufacturers? Is it really a good future where like a few um, corporations basically control everything in all countries? And the last but not least is of course the risk around, uh, around innovation. Innovation of new technologies and machine learning, big data analysis depends on best data results and that are not available to domestic businesses. So. Um, if IT and software is the future, and a lot of people think that, then um, if you want to have local innovation and companies and startups and things happening, you need to be in control of that. But if you're just a customer of a cloud service running somewhere else, then it's really hard to build like innovation and things on top of it. There's also this famous picture which shows um, uh, cloud services in different areas of the world. And you can see that uh, the EU or Europe is a bit lacking behind here. Uh, we have a lot of big companies in China and the US, but Europe is really lacking behind. And the question is what this means for, for the future. And of course, there's then the connection to open source and free software, which from my perspective is um, the solution for this problem. Because with free software and open source, you have the freedom to run things as you want. You can run it on a big cloud service if you want, but you can also run it um, locally if you want to have the data, the results, and the analysis, and the machine learning, everything local. Uh, you have the choice. And also from an innovation perspective, you can really build nice innovation on top of open source and free software because you can actually look inside. You can actually learn it and understand it. You can teach it in school, and you can really build something on top of it. Well, if you're just a subscriber of some cloud service, there's nothing you can do, right? You don't understand how it works, you cannot replicate it, you can you have a login, you can cannot get out of it. And because of that, building like the IT 
future on top of open source and free software is um, super important from my perspective. So obviously there are the four freedoms, don't have to repeat it here in this circles. I think this was postulated by Richard Stallman uh, many years ago, um, which the first is the freedom to run this program as you wish for any purpose. All right, you actually can run the software because you're not really running software on AWS or Google Cloud because you're just using a service. Um, the freedom to study how the program works, this is so important. I mean, so important that like young people can actually look inside and see how it go, how it works and build something on top of it. <coughs> so that something that should be obvious, which is so important for the future. Um, then the third, the freedom to redistribute pieces so you can help your neighbor. Well, you can see that it's still the time where you give like uh, floppy disks to your neighbors. Uh, nowadays, the neighbor is on the internet, I guess. Uh, but still, it's nice to give it to everybody, that everybody has the chance to use this software. Even if you are in, I don't know, somewhere in Africa, in an under, underdeveloped country, where we don't really have the money to buy software licenses or something. It's available for everybody. Um, and uh, the first, uh, fourth one, which is probably the most important one, that you have the freedom to change the software, to improve it, and then also to distribute like the changed, improved software also to other people. Because this is how innovation happens, right? You're standing on the shoulders of giants, you're helping each other, you're leveling yourself up one step after another. And this is like, really super important for innovation. Yeah, and this is a model that we try to follow with, uh, with Nextcloud. Um, so, to tell you a little bit about Nextcloud, um, I was first want to start with what we do and how this is all positioned. So when I, when I started this uh, 11 years ago, um, as I said, there um, were also no real name for this kind of software. Um, um, I called it open source Dropbox. Um, <laughs> which is not a good name. <laughs> if you want to need to use your proprietary competitor as uh, to define you. Um, a little bit later, Gartner, this um, IT uh, analysis um, uh, company, they introduced the term enterprise file segment share. So this was the idea that you have your data somewhere and then you can access it from your different devices, from your mobile, from your desktop, from your web interface and so on. Um, and since then, everything that um, I did was then called Enterprise File Union Share, according to Gartner. Um, but um, from my perspective, this is just an intermediate step. So I see it basically like a file server that you all know from the 70s and 80s, um, 90s, um, is like the grandfather here. File swing, enterprise File Union Share is already, can do, already do a little bit more because you can access it from your phone, you can share it with others, you have versioning, you have a trash bin, and all the things. But in the end, it's about collaboration software. It's about working together, distributed. And especially nowadays, uh, with COVID, we also all experience how this is. If you are not sitting in the same office, um, or same university, or school class together, it's so important to work over the internet, to collaborate, to communicate. And this is what we, what we try to do. Again, I had a problem how to call that. I called it like, yeah, something like Office 365 or Google Workspace, but open source and self-hosted. Again, a bit of a weird definition, but Gartner, uh, they renamed Enterprise Files so you can share to Content Collaboration Platform like two years ago. And yeah, since then we are officially a Content Collaboration Platform. So we're trying to do something similar as Microsoft with 365. Google Workspace, <coughs> Box.com and many others, but again with the difference that it's 100% open source and you can run it yourself from a Raspberry Pi to a server for your, I don't know, for your soccer club, for your university, for your school or for your government if you have a lot of users. But you have the choice how to run it and where to run it, but that's the difference. Um, so this is, this also has the result that we have, what we do is basically split up in different um, components. So we have Nextcloud Files, which is for the files so you can share, Talk for chat and video conferencing, Groomware for mail, calendar contacts, and then Office for yeah, editing Office documents together. Um, all under the name Nextcloud Hub, which is a combination of everything. And this is about productivity, security, open source, and on-premise. 
So on-premise usually means that you have your own server in your basement. You can do that, but you can also give it to a service provider you trust. But the point is that you can choose and you can migrate it away uh, around um, if you want to. So there are a lot of users who started with running in a Raspberry Pi and then it's running, a, a big, they realized that it should be redundant, high availability, give it to a service provider and then maybe they want to move to another service provider or want to use, uh, move to the to their own service in the basement again, so you have to cho you, have, you can choose basically. Same way you can choose with your website or your mail server or whatever, you should also choose with these modern services. So now I have a lot of slides about actually functionality of everything. So can I quickly ask who knows Nextcloud already? Okay, not, <laughs> okay. but maybe it's good that you have a lot of <laughs> screenshots and slides now. If, again, if this becomes too boring, interrupt me if you have any questions, please. But then maybe I can go through it a little bit, how this all looks like. Um, when you log in into the web interface of Nextcloud for the first time, then you have this dashboard. The dashboard is like the, the introduction screen. Uh, there are different widgets, with drag and drop, you can move them around, you can add new ones. But the idea is basically to give you um, an overview of what's going on. There are like um, recommended files that are new to you, chat messages, ongoing um, video calls that you may be part of it, events in your calendar, project management, tools, all kinds of things. But it's a dashboard basically. But then if you go into the files, on top of the anime is the navigation, then this is the main interface where you have like a file manager basically. You can upload files, download files, delete, undelete, access versions, share them with others, um, and so on and so on. It's like a file manager in the browser. Um, then you can share them with others inside your organization, inside the server with other users or with people outside. And you have lots of options like read only or shoot with a password or expire at some time or adding a note what it is and so on and so on. If you want to create a new file, you can have a, you have a templating system where they can choose between like, hey, I want to create a type of, I don't know, a meeting note or like a whatever new invoice and basically there are templates then copied over. Um, if you have an organization with lots and lots of users and lots and lots of organizations, because there are also big organizations using Nextcloud, um, so for example there is 300,000 users in the French government, and 350,000 users in the German government, and there are a lot of big organizations, then you really have thousands of folders and users, and sometimes it's hard to know what goes into what folder. If you know how it is with huge file servers, it can be a bit overwhelming. Then we have this feature that you can, on top of a folder, you can document with a markdown file um, what's in there. And that's also visible on your phone and your tablet and your desktop client too. So it is nice to document it. You can lock a file and then you can say, hey, I want to be the only one who is editing this, um, this file now because I don't want to have any conflicts. If other people are editing the same file at the same time, then it should be locked. But if you realize that a file is locked and you cannot edit it, you can directly start a chat with the people to say, hey, why have you edited, uh, locked this file? I want to edit it now. Can you unlock it now? So it's really nice to work together. There's a Photos app where all the photos are automatically stored um, and you can view them based on location and albums and so on. There are uh, mobile apps. Um, so there's an iOS and Android for tablet and phone. Um, um, app where you can yeah, access all your files, sync them offline, upload them again, and everything you expect. Um, there's a push notification system, so you get push notification on devices. If someone sends you a chat message, someone calls you, if, you, if a file is shared with you, if you're running out of quota, whatever, something happens. There are also desktop clients for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, similar to Dropbox, where like um, your files on the server are synced up offline to your desktop, and you can work on your laptop if you're offline, train or plane or somewhere, 
Um, I heard that in Norway you have like internet in the trains. Um, that's awesome. It's still struggling with that in Germany <laughs> somehow, but yeah. It doesn't work so well. <laughs> I'm sure it's better than in Germany, but yeah. Well, when you're on top of the mountain, it doesn't really work at all. Well, okay, yeah. So, but, but sometimes it works, but it's, it's <laughs> flaky. Flaky yeah, yeah. internet. Yeah, but that's actually then a good feature because you can edit the file and once yeah. you have internet connection back, the yeah. change is synced up again. Yeah. So that's... Yeah, uh, you may, may have windows of good connection. <laughs> and then it's gone again, of course. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. As I said, I'm sure it's better than Germany, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a disaster. But yeah, um, you can click on files like uh, pictures and videos and PDFs and you can obviously view them in a nice mm -hmm. way. You, we have um, accessibility features, which are very important. Where you can have, for example, a high contrast theme or a dark theme or special, um, more readable fonts and many other features. Um, authentication is a very important thing. You can connect this to an LDAP server or Active Directory or something else, or OpenID Connect or SAML. Um, but you can also use the internal um, user management if you want. Um, and you can, in, uh, can combine different um, things together, for example, for two-factor authentication. For example, that's the next slide. Um, you can have two-factor with um, um, open OTP, for example, or with a push notification, or with an SMS, or all kinds of other services you want. Um, and we have integration into this web OSN standard, um, which is um, supported by Apple and Microsoft, so you can log in with your fingerprint or whatever. Um, so that's all. Um, nice. Um, we have some built-in device management bit. So if you use your phone, for example, you can go into settings and say, yeah, I want to um, um, delete the phone, the data on the phone, not the phone itself. <laughs> um, so that's nice. And you can also do this in an admin, or you can do this personally, only for specific devices. Yeah. A cool feature we implemented like two years ago is actually some machine learning, also we want to do something cool. <laughs> so this uh, Nextcloud contains uh, actually a real neural network which, um, which is trained uh, based on the login behavior. Um, so you get a warning if like, hey, this user never logs in in the middle of the night from China, there's something weird. Um, and then you can get a warning or log the account and something like that. Um, you can uh, configure policies which is quite um, popular and powerful. For example, the sysadmin can say, um, everybody in the, I don't know, marketing LDAP group um, should be able or not be able to share a file, which is an Excel file over 10 megabytes to an IP address in China at Saturday if it's tagged with VIP or something. So they can all kinds of policies um, to restrict that, uh, to make sure that some data stays like in your local network or some um, uh, data stays in the EU or your country or whatever policy you have. Um, with shared folders, you can also have um, access control lists, um, as you know from typical file servers. Um, we have an end-to-end -end encryption feature where um, the data is encrypted on the desktop and mobile apps and then stored only encrypted on the server. Um, that's something that can be enabled and disabled on a folder basis because it comes with some restrictions uh, because then the web interface, for example, doesn't work in, uh, anymore. And also sharing um, doesn't work at the moment. The architecture is designed to also do um, with a private public key system to also support uh, shared files encrypted shared files, but it's not implemented yet. So this is basically for your own um, files that you only you should uh, be able to read and not to determine. There's a feature called Data Access Engine, which means you can actually mount other data sources inside it into your next cloud. So in your organization, if you have like a Windows or Samba file server, SharePoint, S3, Swift, FTP, some other storage, you can all mount this into your next cloud and you have like one tree over all your data. And you can do this as a user or you can also do this as an admin. Basically you can say, okay, all my users, they have their home directory which is on whatever NFS somewhere automatically mounted as slash home into their next cloud. 
So this gives a nice feature to consolidate data. Is, is that one a first class citizen when it comes to parse I think so, yeah. 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 There are some technical challenges. Um, for example, everything that happens in Nextcloud, obviously Nextcloud knows about it and can always update the indexes and the search results and everything. But everything that happens in an external storage, for example, if you mount a, a Windows network drive, um, but this is also directly accessible from the user, the Nextcloud doesn't know what's going on inside there, so it regularly has to scan it, which you have to know what you're doing because it can be at some point resulted in a lot of load because you do a lot of rescanning or uh, changes only show up after a few minutes. If can you, you define the, the schedule? Yes, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. But besides that, it's a first class citizen and it works fine. A lot of universities do that where you have like a classic home directory then mounted into Nextcloud and then <coughs> You suddenly have it on your phone, or you can sync it offline, which you cannot do otherwise. Another benefit of having that is, of course, that search then works, um, because we have uh, a nice, a powerful integrated search where you can search for files, fold and file name, and there's a plugin uh, which also integrates Elastic or the newer forks of it, of course. Um, to uh, so, uh, you can also search inside the files then which is then very powerful, and you can suddenly search your Windows file server or something that you could not do uh, before. And this unified search also means that you can find other things. You can also find the chat messages and calendar messages and uh, users and everything else. There's an Outlook plugin if you really want to use Outlook. <laughs> there's, but there's still a lot of organizations who really like Outlook. Um, so there's a plugin where you can just I don't know, take a gigabyte file, drag it into a mail, press in unsend, and then uh, the, uh, the plugin automatically uploads it to Nextcloud, creates a share link, puts the share link into the mail, and then sends the mail. So you can basically send unlimited um, attachments, um, which, yeah, is good. First of all, you can do that, and second, you don't have all the files on your exchange server, which is uh, difficult to scale. Um, and you can also do other fancy, fancy features, for example, you can see once someone um, uh, opened the file, um, for example. So another important feature is federation, because as I said in the beginning, my goal is really to, um, to prevent that all information communication files of everybody is like stored just by five big companies to really enable everybody to have their own server, their own um, service, their own yeah, collaboration system. Um, and millions of people do that with Raspberry Pis and all kinds of systems. But then you have many, many islands. Right? Uh, I have my next cloud, you have your next cloud, you have your next cloud, you have a university next cloud, you have a company next cloud, you have next cloud from a service provider. But then everything is disconnected somehow. And because of that, we implemented many years ago already this federation feature, which means, let's say this is a Raspberry Pi here from someone, and there's a user, and this user can say, hey, I want to share this file or folder with someone who is here, a user at this university, or using Nextcloud, or someone who is a service provider, or using in their company or something. And this works. So you can have a shared folder or shared file, peer-to-peer, -peer, between different servers, and nothing is stored on a central place. I mean, we at Nextcloud, we have no infrastructure, we store nothing, no users, no file, nothing, obviously, and this is all peer-to-peer -peer network, which is, for some people, mind-blowing that this works, but it's actually not that mind-blowing, because that's exactly how email works, for example. Right? So you have, like, everybody can have a mail server, you have a mail server in your university, at school, you can have your own mail server, you can, have, can be a Gmail, whatever, but we can all send each other emails right, because it's using the same protocol. And it's the same we have here with file sharing and collaboration. Um, it's also uh, one, one, yeah. one question uh, regarding previous slides. Uh, you, the open cloud match, is that um, something from you? Yeah, that's a good question. So. I'm a huge fan 
of, of open standards. So we use open standards for everything as much as possible. So for example, the file transfer is WebDAV, there's CalDAV and CARDAV for calendar and contacts, there's activity pub standard for social interactions and so on. Um, we only do our own APIs when it's absolutely needed. In this case, there was not nothing like that. So the open cloud mesh is an invention of the next cloud community. But it is nowadays endorsed um, um, by CERN, CERN in Switzerland, the particle accelerator. Um, they basically brought together a coalition of different software companies and they all support the same API. Yeah. So the open cloud mesh is an API for peer to peer between the different yes. cloud services. Yeah. Um, and are there other software is available that support mm -hmm. it? Yeah, there is, um, there is uh, Paidio from France implemented it, C-File from China implemented it, my first project, own cloud, also implemented it. Um, so they're all compatible, yeah. One thing about what, uh, what kind of, um, pro uh, what, what protocols it is and, and, and how is the or authentication and encryption and that kind of thing working on, yeah. on, on, on it, because you will necessarily Come travel through places you don't have any control over in this case. Yeah, it is all, I don't know, super easy, surprisingly easy. So the Open Cloud Mesh protocol is actually, I don't remember, three or four REST calls. It's all it is. Um, the first one is basically a call where one server contacts another server and telling, hey, there is a share request. So first of all, how it works from a user perspective, um, I can go to one of my files. Let's say I want to share my vacation photos with, your, with my family, with, which are on a different server. Then I basically, in the dialog, I type in username at server. Very similar to email. And you have a host name, the other instance, and username is then the username, and in between is the at sign. It looks very similar to a, an email address which is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, but then, basically, my server knows the host name of this other instance where my family members are, and then it does a REST call to this other server and say, hey, there is this user Frank from this server who wants to share it with whatever, I don't know, John on this other server. And then the server um, asks John, hey, there's a share request. Um, do you want to accept it or not? Um, and part of that is also the submission of a secret, like a key. And um, if then the user says, yeah, that's, I know the person, I want to have the files, click yes, then basically with this key, it can basically then a web dev mount on the other server. And then suddenly he has this as a folder mounted in, in, in his or her next cloud. Yeah. And there's a little bit more behind it with accept and reject and expiration and messages and so on and so on. But it's not it's not a lot more. It's basically if you would send someone a GPG mail, which is like, hey, there's a mail, here's my public key, here we can access it. Okay, then it's not really the same, okay. <laughs> but it's, you know what yeah, yeah, actually, actually, that was one of the because one of the things with the, the GPG and, and such is that it's almost impossible for many users to use it. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah. my 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 high level question was really: Have you solved that problem? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I, I solved that. Um, basically, there is everybody has a unique ID which is again username at hostname. And with that, the API can really ask the users and then uh, initiate the sharing. The problem is, of course, how do you get this unique ID? Because if you use, like, I don't know, Microsoft or Google or whatever, you can just type in a clear text name and then your, all your relatives pop up because Google has all the data anyways. Um, and you just say, yeah, that's John, click, done. But for us, it's a bit more complicated because we really have to ask, well, what's your host name? And uh, what host name? What's the host name? And then what's the username? Uh, I don't know. So we really thought a lot how to make this discoverable. So we have something, we have a few concepts for that. The first concept is a, is a trusted server concept. 
So this is something again can be enabled or disabled depends on on the use case. Trusted server concept is that um, maybe I don't know. This is my home next cloud, and this is the next cloud of my friend who has the same. And I send here a share request to a person here, and let's say this person here says yes, I know the person. Then um, the two servers are the trusted servers. It basically was confirmed once, and then they exchange address books, which then from now on I have auto completion for everybody here. Because then if I don't want to share like with, um, I don't know, the husband, but then just the wife, I can just type in the name, but because it's synchronized to address books, I have just type in the name and order completion click done. That's like a peer-to-peer -peer order completion idea. That's the first thing. The second is that you can again disable or enable if you want. And the other one is this lookup server concept. So we, we run a public lookup server for the whole community, but you can also run something yourself if you want. And a lookup server is something like a public phone book or a GBG key server, basically. So I can, if I type in, for example, what to share with you, type in your name, then maybe my server doesn't know your host name or user ID, but then I can click a search button and then it asks this lookup server which is very similar as you might know from GBG clients, we can look up your public key and then maybe you pushed your contact data to this lookup server um, and then I can find you and share with you. That's very similar to a phone book. Right? If you have a phone, I don't know how it is in, Germany, in, 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 in Norway, but in Germany, if you get a new phone, um, you can choose if you want to be listed in the public phone book or not. And it's very similar here. If you say no, then people can only call you if you know your number. Or if you want to be found under your clear text name, then you can be found under your clear text name. And that's a bit of the idea here. I don't know if this answers the question. Yeah. <coughs> um, we, we all know by email. Um, everyone started starting each other with emails as soon as they, they got, uh, got hold of your email address. So, so it, it, are there any mechanisms in place to avoid those problems? Yeah. So there are. For, there instance, are with, for instance, with such a centralized lookup server, then yeah. suddenly everyone gets share requests from <laughs> someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there are ways where you can um, have um, allow list or disallow list where you could configure that. There are ways to configure like rate limits, for example. So if that like the US attacks doesn't happen, for example, and there are ways to, to regulate it. Um, and you also have the freedom to, of course, to completely lock it, lock it down and say, oh, yeah, you want to accept it from people I know. At the end, it's something you need to decide for yourself. If you want to be found by the whole world and you're really popular and with your name, then yeah, you might get a lot of share requests. Yeah. But you can configure it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a similar concept we yeah. also use for scalability. Oh yeah. Yeah. If I have published my uh, my identity to a lookup server, is yeah. there a way to remove it? Yeah, of course. But it's um, <coughs> there's a there's a call where it's um, removed and our lookup server has implemented and the data is deleted. Of course. Also, if I have deleted my next cloud server, for instance. Which is one problem with GPG, for uh, where I have several keys in the yeah. uh, <laughs> lookup servers, which I don't even have anymore. I mean, short answer: yes, you can delete it, and yes, you can change your data. But of course, reality is sometimes a bit more complicated because only because we delete it on the server doesn't mean that there exists no copies from other well, people somewhere else. I was more, more worried about the part where uh, I've lost my server yeah. and uh, I don't want the record to be out there anymore because it's wrong. Yeah. There's a way to, to delete your data there. Um, hoping that everybody else also decides to forget it then. A similar problem with email, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you can, I don't know, 
tell everybody that your email is gone, but there are still a lot of other people who still have it and still keep on sending your emails. And I don't have a good answer for that. One of the benefits of us like even evil centralized services like Facebook and Google, <laughs> they can do that, but distributed is always a bit. Um, scalability. So, um, as I said, next that runs on a Raspberry Pi for whatever five users, that's all fine. Um, with a, like a bigger Linux uh, server, you can run it for like hundreds or maybe thousands of users. Then uh, you can have a cluster, obviously, clustered application server, cluster database, cluster storage, and so on. And then you can go to hundreds of thousands of users. But sometimes there are even like um, people who want to use it even bigger. So the biggest instance uh, we know of has uh, 20 million users. Um, and 20 million users is um, really a lot. And for that, we implemented um, basically a system where you can run a Nextcloud distributed over different hosting centers with different, on different continents even. And that's interesting because it's using the same federation system that I described before. So you basically um, have, you can have lots of hosting centers, lots of clusters. Basically this is a cluster of cluster. And then if you want to share with someone, um, it's using the same federation system, even if they're not physically on the same hosting center. If you know what I mean. But that's basically a system where you can have hosting centers on different continents, each with clusters, um, but they can all work together as if it is one, so, um, one server. And there's a central component um, called a global site selector. This is, you have one URL where you log in, and then you automatically redirect it to the instance where you are. Um, and there's even a system, a balancer, where the system can decide to migrate your user account from one system to another system if one is overloaded or something. And this can run um, in the background and you don't even notice it. And because there's also a lookup server part of that, it's automatically updated. So your host name might change because the system decided to move you to a different continent or something. But you don't even notice because you just do like all the completion of normal usernames. Same as with Google, they do the same, right? You don't, the infrastructure, the background is hidden. So this really helps with scalability a lot. Um, then I want to talk a little bit uh, about something cool that we launched actually yesterday. So that's a cool feature for backup. So yesterday we, um, this is only beta one, but the final will be out in four weeks, so not far away. But that's a peer-to-peer -peer backup system. So the idea is, if you have your next cloud on a Raspberry Pi at home, you probably want to back up it. I mean, you of course want to back up it like everything. But the question is how and where. Um, we have a new system where you can back up your, uh, your data on the next cloud of a friend, for example. And this is all encrypted, obviously. Uploaded in the background, you can schedule it for to have incremental backups or full backups. Um, fully encrypted, fully compressed. Um, and your friend gives you some quota, whatever, a few gigabytes of quota, and your system is back up there. And for example, this data is then back up somewhere else. It can be used peer to peer, where you back up your files around between different servers. And that's, I find it very cool. It goes into the concept of distributing everything, um, but it's only better one. Um, you can test it if you want, but it um, will be available like next month. Yeah, next month. So this so far was the file management. Maybe you want to go th um, quickly through it. Um, the other components, there's also Nextlot Talk, which is a chat system. So uh, we have group chats and one-on-one -on -one chats. It looks similar to Slack or Teams, um, or also a bit like ISC, but with pictures, I guess. <laughs> um, where you can just talk with each other, collaborate in, in, in your work groups, um, you, all, you all know it. You can press a button and turn this into a video call, uh, where you can have a video call, same as like uh, Zoom and Teams and so on. Again, everything open source, everything running on your Raspberry Pi or whatever you want. Um, there are also mobile apps, iOS and Android, where you get push notifications if someone's chatting with you um, or 
recording you, screen sharing, of course. Um, you can upload a file directly into a channel, and then other people can see it, or if it's an office document, you can edit it together. Webinars um, you can do. There is a dashboard where you can then collaboratively work together on a dashboard. That's something we did for schools, so very, very popular in schools. Um, a chatbot system where you can implement chatbots. It's actually quite cool because um, you can map this um, these chat commands to like bash scripts. Um, <laughs> so it's super easy to uh, to extend. You can do slash blah 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 a command, and this is then mapped to a bash script, which is always coupled with the parameters. And then you can do something, whatever you want, ping something, uh, reboot the server, okay, maybe not, but I don't know, do some, do some operation, and the result is then putting back, back into the chat. So that's actually super uh, easy to implement some kind of fun things you want to have in your organization. Um, then uh, mobile apps or chat, again with push notification, as I said. Um, and it's all integrated in sharing. For example, here I shared a PDF with someone, and then the site is automatically uh, a chat where you can talk together with the people um, who look at this PDF together. Um, maybe from a technological networking um, aspect, the background is also interesting. Um, so this is all implemented using WebRTC, of course. Um, so um, this means that your browser is sending you a video call to all other participants of the same call, peer-to-peer, -peer, which means it, there is no component which can somehow has all the information, it's fully encrypted, peer-to-peer -peer encrypted, and it's all great. The problem is the number of connections really grow um, a lot when you have more participants in the call. And if you want to have a call with like 20 people, then your browser needs to send like a video um, stream to 19 others and receive it from 19 others, which at some point doesn't work anymore. And for that, um, we have this new component, this high performance backend, inclusive of customers, is bullshit, I've blown outdated. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a system where all the streams can be sent to a central component, uh, encode it together, and send it out to everybody which then scales to a lot more users. And you can have like, I think we have schools with over 100 users in, in a call. Um, yeah. uh, question regarding um, the, the tap function. Is yeah. the tap function also WebRTC? And no, no. Um, this is normal REST. Um, normal REST, okay. No, no. The, so the, if that were to be federated, with all those services? Yeah, good question. So first of all, I want to say that um, there's a slide which is missing here, I need to update that. Since yes, last year we also have bridging support, so these chat rooms can be bridged into other systems. For example, you can bridge it like to IRC or to Jabber or even to, um, to Zoom or to Teams, where then you have like a chat room here and everything is written here, it's mirrored on that side and the other way around. So this already helps a little bit, so you can bridge it like between Nextcloud servers too. And then, but the real federation is something we are working on at the moment. It's coming with the next release, where you can really have a chat room, where people are in the room that are actually are different servers. So based on matrix or based on... Not clear yet, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, want to, we really, really, really want to use the matrix protocol. Unfortunately, it's uh, crazy complex and changing all the time, but we're trying there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, groupware, um, that's a bit more boring, that's straightforward. It's a calendar, you can share it with others, um, access it from your phone, all the usual things, different use, free PC, resource booking, everything we expect. Um, there's a nice integration, for example, if you want to create a new um, meeting. With one click, you can automatically create a room in Nextcloud Talk and attach it to the 
to the invitation. So I automatically said, hey, here's this conversation, and here's the chat room, and here's the video calling room automatically in the invitation. There's a mail client, so we don't have our, not, not our own mail server, which would be a bad idea. There are plenty of mail servers out there. But we have a nice web interface um, that you can use to read your mails. And we even have some um, intelligence with it is. Uh, we are collaborating with the KDE community, so we can detect uh, tickets that are attached to mails. And automatically say, hey, this is a train ticket, this is a plane ticket, and add it to your calendar automatically. There's uh, Nextcloud Deck, which is a Kanban board, uh, quite popular for project management. Yeah, so that's good there. The last component is then Office. Um, which is obviously very popular for companies where you want to work with documents. The first thing is, this is our own implementation, is a markdown editor. Um, that you can just, inside Nextflow, without any other software, just edit markdown with all the usual mark mark uh, markups, pictures and so on. And this is a collaborative markdown editor, which everybody with the same document uh, show up as our topic, which is on top. And you can just write the same document, and you have like color highlighting who wrote what. Um, so that's super nice, especially for um, brainstorming or meeting notes or something. And we have this integrated into Nextcloud Talk, which means uh, okay, which means you have a chat and a video call um, in the corner for all the people who are writing the same document at the moment. So that's something that really we do all the time. Um, if you're not in the same office, if you just want to brainstorm about something, um, that's very, very popular. But that's only markdown, right? That's not really good enough for real companies. So what they want to have is a real office solution where you can edit Microsoft Office or Excel PowerPoint files. Um, that's something we obviously cannot do. That's a bit, <laughs> a lot of work. But we integrated two other great software. Yeah, this only this first one is only Office. Um, that's a software which is um, unfortunately only partly open source. But um, there's a community edition which can do a lot of things. And there you can directly in Nextcloud edit Word files, Excel files, and so on. And you can also do this collaboratively. So you can with different cursors at the same time work in the same document. And the other software we integrated is Collabra Online. <clears throat> this is uh, basically LibreOffice, uh, done by Collabra, which is the company which did, is the biggest contributor to LibreOffice at the moment. Uh, in the background, there is a full LibreOffice running, and you can also um, edit all Office documents and also collaboratively. You can also have like, different people with different cursors here yeah, editing the same document. Um, and that's basically based on a normal file, which is a bit different than with Google Docs. For example, you have to import your Office document, then edit it collaboratively, and then at some point you have to say, okay, stop editing, I'm exporting it now again and deleting it, and now I have it as a normal Word file again. And that's a bit stupid. So this is just a normal file. Just click on it, you edit it, close it, it's done. And again, we have integrated like talk for video calling and chatting in the sidebar directly. And that's also very popular. And it works on mobile. So that's an iPad, but also on Android it's the same. But you can also edit things collaboratively directly on the iPad if you want. Um, and there is a, there are some security features. For example, you can say um, this document can be edited by other people, but not downloaded. Um, and you might think, hmm, how is this possible? But that's actually working because Colabra um, renders the document on the server and sends you only basically the PNGs of the document. Um, so there's, you really have no way of downloading it. Um, and if you want to take a photo or a screenshot of the document, then you can automatically <coughs> add watermarks to it based on text or other, um, other uh, conditions. So that's a feature that, yeah, sometimes people who really want to protect their data um, really like that. Okay, so now I gave you enough of <laughs> product show. Hope it was not too boring. Um, 
now I want to talk a little bit about how we try to give next note to everybody um, and a little bit about the community to wrap up. So the first thing we thought is that, or maybe I should do the slides in a different order maybe. <laughs> Let's do that way around. Okay. So first of all, you can go to our website. A lot of people think you can create an account there. No, you can't, because we don't do any hosting. We just produce the software. The only thing we have is a big download button. You download the software, put it on a server you want, and then you have your next load for your friends, family, group, whatever. Um, and you can have this as a just native zip file, or of course there are packages for all kind of Linux distributions, or um, BSD. I think you're a BSD <laughs> fan, I think there's, there's BSD support for it. Mm -hmm. So you have this native natively too, if you want. Um, but there are also appliances. So if you want to run it as a Docker or as a virtual machine or something, Snap for Ubuntu. So there are also like packages for all kinds of things. <coughs> um, and we work together with some projects who offer like boxes with Nextcloud on top of it. So there's always the idea that you have this like small computer and you have it at home and everything is there. Then most of them are not completely done as they should be, for example. Sometimes you don't, the backup is still work in progress or high availability or then configuring the DNS that actually can be accessed from the outside and so on. And some things are a bit still tricky, but there are some community projects, some boxes we can buy with Nextcloud in it and then your own your home server basically. And that one thing, uh, if you provide your own server, uh, very often you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have an uh, official uh, internet visible IP address. Yeah. So how uh, do you deal with that? I mean, these are not done by us, this is about done from community. I don't think they have an answer for that. That's one of the problems. Yeah. So, so it's, it's currently a problem that if you want to make this uh, accessible, uh, you need to have you need to have you to post it on a place that is visible on the internet. I mean, this is a bit out of scope for Nextcloud. Like we only do the software. I mean, the the whole hosting and networking, we don't really want to deal with it too much. But it's definitely a problem. There are some there are some solutions for that. <laughs> There are some reverse proxy solutions where you can uh, can do that. They also have the benefit that they're tunneled through your router and you also give you a, a host name, a DNS name, which is accessible, but it then costs money and they have the data basically piping through. Sure, but uh, my, my question was more whether there is uh, any provision for making such things easy. Uh, We're trying to, if you have any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, so that's a bit of a problem. Yeah, yeah sure, uh, that's why I asked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nah, we, as you might have seen in the presentation, we really try to make it super easy for everybody, but yeah, running your own server at home is still not that easy, unfortunately. <clears throat> this gives, brings me to my first slide, actually, that I jumped over, is there's another thing we try to do to make it easy. Um, because if you're just a normal user, you know nothing about IT, and you want to use like Google or Microsoft or Dropbox, what you do nowadays, you go to the App Store, um, the iOS or Android App Store, and you type in Dropbox, and then you get Dropbox, and then there's a button, create account, and you have an account, and then you're done. So that's of course a bit difficult for someone like us to do that. But we did an initiative called Simple Sign Up. And the idea is, because there are like hundreds, maybe thousands of service providers in the world who offer Nextcloud hosting, and we invite them for free to come to us and say, hey, I want to be part of this Simple Sign Up program. And then if you download the Nextcloud apps from the App Store, there's a button or login if you have your own server, if you know what you're doing, or sign up with a provider. And if you click there, you come to a screen like that, where different service providers are recommended to you. They based on location and languages and features and all kinds of things. And then you say, ah, oh, okay, I want to have an account, but this one looks nice, that's like in my phone. Click, and then you automatically have an account with this service provider. 
Of course, you might think, okay, what's then the point if you then logged in by the service provider? But I still think it's a little bit better to have a thousand of them instead of one. But at the end, you then have an account at the service provider. Yeah. What do you think about the simplicity? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, to be honest, it's a little a little complicated uh, uh, when because you, as I, I would think that I would have no idea why I should choose any of them. Yeah. Uh, so so it, it's uh, it, it it makes a little bit more of uh, resistance and things. I think. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but is uh, is not next level at least written such that we can in any way migrate your data from one to the other. Yeah, that's, that's a feature we're also working on to have like a one click migrate your account from one provider to another thing. Um, which hopefully also with the next release, I don't know, I hope so. Still some work to be done. But this would be then the solution, yeah. If you're there and you don't like them anymore, then you click and go to another one, another one, another one. This would be the perfect situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, last but not least of all, contribute because Nextcloud is uh, an open source project. I, I haven't really said that. Nextcloud, of course, there's also a company that I'm representing. Um, so we have a business model by selling um, support to bigger companies, very similar to Red Hat and SUSE and uh, MariaDB and others, where the software is completely free, you can do what you want if you know what you're doing. But if you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> you can come to us and we give you phone support and workshops and help with updates and stuff like that. And this is how we make our money. But we as a small company would not be able to develop everything on our own. Um, this is why Nextcloud is also an open source community. So we have over 2,000 volunteers uh, writing code actually. And this is just Nextcloud, um, Nextcloud, the core itself. So this is a photo of our developer conference. It was obviously before Corona. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, very, yeah, bring people together. I think there are 200 people or something in, in Berlin at the time. Uh, from the 2,000 volunteers, and they do all kinds of things, testing, feature requests, translation, packaging, everything. Um, but of course there are also the add-ons, the apps. So we have a lot of plugins and add-ons that are even counted here. The, we have this repository, this app store, but it's of course not a store, it's all free. But you can then, I don't know, do an OCR plugin, or some new music player, or I don't know, group for all kinds of things. And they're all done by a community. Um, we develop everything in the open, so everything is on GitHub in our case. There's sometimes a question if we move to GitLab, but um, yeah, there's just a lot of people on GitHub, this service still there. Um, and it comes up also sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's of course. <laughs> open comes up, right? Why not self hosting? And of course, you could do that. At the moment, we're still there because. It's just for contributors more convenient to send pull requests there. But it's a question, yeah, it's owned by Microsoft now and yeah. yeah. I was just thinking that it was a, uh, for me it would be the perfect next step to have a Git server. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Maybe in the future. <laughs> yeah. At the moment we are prioritizing, like having a happy big community a bit higher, but it's, yeah, it's a question. But there's everything there, there's the code, there's the feature discussions, there's a pull request, the bug reports, um, everything is there. And um, everybody's equal, um, which means if someone wants to change something, then you can send a pull request. And two other people need to basically review it and say it's a thumbs up. And this doesn't have to be someone from the company or we don't have a chief maintainer who is the ultimate saying or something, it's really a community process and this is why we have so many happy contributors. Yeah, and everybody is welcome, I mean bug reports of course, we always collect feedback there. Um, translations, um, I think this is a bit outdated, I think we have way over 100 languages nowadays 
including Klingon and others. <laughs> <laughs> Modern, I guess. That was one of the first time that came, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Yeah. Um, yeah, code contribution, as I said, everybody is, is, is welcome. Um, we have a diversity program um, where we want to encourage underrepresented groups um, to um, join the community, where we have mentoring, internships, travel support, and other things. And yeah, we're trying to be this nice and open uh, community. Because I think if you really want to compete with Microsoft and Google and the, and the other big guys, you can only do this as a big open source community group. It's no way you can do this as a company or something. It's like not possible. Okay, the summary would be that we try to provide the same user experience and features as Office 365 in the Google suite. But you can host it wherever you want because of that it's also compliant. It doesn't matter if you're GDPR compliant or HIPAA compliant or whatever. I mean, you have the software. You can look inside it. You can make sure that there are no backdoors in it. You can run it as you want. Have all the backup, high availability, archiving, everything as you want. And because of that, you can build the service that is compliant for you. There are no foreign laws involved. This is, of course, a reference to the Cloud Act. Um, that some of you might know, that's the, okay, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so that's an interesting law because uh, it's in the US law, um, because it's a bit unexpected. There are a lot of people, uh, politicians in Germany, all over Europe, who think that, well, if the data is hosted in the whole country, then it's somehow safe. But the Cloud Act actually says that, um, that every US company has to follow US law even if they do business in other countries, basically. So US government or police or secret service or whatever can tell Amazon or Microsoft or Twitter or Dropbox or whatever, just give me all the data even if it's run by a local subsidiary in a local hosting center in a different country, whatever, they still have full access to everything. Um, so this, of course, then collides with the GDPR. This is why we have a fight in the European Court of Justice at the moment. If this, the cloud is actually compatible with GDPR at the moment, the court said no. So, and these are all interesting problems that obviously we don't have at all because Nextcloud doesn't store any data, we have nothing, we just give you the software and you do what you want with it. And this, if you really care about privacy and digital sovereignty and open source, then this is of course a bit of a better way to do your collaboration, communication, than yeah, getting a Microsoft account, I think. Um, yeah, and that's the same again. But turns these Dropbox, Google Suite, Office 365, on premise, open source, and distributed, federated. This would be then my oops, too far. <laughs> the last slide. So thanks a lot. I hope we still have time for discussions because that's the most fun for me than having lots of slides. What is it? yeah, what do you think? So if you set up your own instance for if I set up something just for home for Using it for a few things. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to run a subset of the modules to have oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the the things I care about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Must That's have uh, yet yeah, another yeah. service. I always forget to <laughs> forget to mention that because all the features I mean, uh, they can be a bit overwhelming. So this is all um, structured in plugins that we call apps. You can know all of that. You can enable and disable as you want. So you don't have to use everything. <clears throat> yeah, uh, the new government in Norway has uh, promised to uh, deploy a cloud service for the whole public sector. Um, so, moving away from home, can this scale to a small country? <laughs> and given that we already have the authentication mechanisms in place? Yeah, I mean, as I said, we have 300,000 people in the German government are using it. 
350,000 in France. <coughs> I think Netherlands, like only one or two ministries. Three weeks ago I was in Stockholm because there is an initiative in Sweden to do something similar. I also want to move all of the government to something like Nextcloud. I think this yeah, works. This is some new government in Norway, so maybe you should be on the push. <laughs> uh, I don't know, have they decided? Is it just plans? New plans? It is a serious question because uh, yeah. Norway is a bit overcapitalized. Um, so it tends to just. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Or the government is at least, so we have this tendency to um, just throw a lot of money on, on things. Yeah. So, for example, if we meet this uh, challenge that, well, we can't store the data in the US of A, well, then we just pay Microsoft 300 million uh, to build a new data center in Norway. That is the way we usually uh, solve stuff. But this time around, um, I think actually uh, the cloud idea will be pursued. I don't know how. I have no uh, context in <coughs> the new government for yeah. irritating reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the push for uh, this uh, government cloud and control of data um, is partly coming from um, Norwegian unions for some uh, reason. And the idea will be pushed. So it's a serious question um, if um, software uh, uh, like Nextcloud um, could do the job. They haven't uh, um, said anything specific uh, of what this cloud is to deliver, but I um, assume uh, file and file sharing is maybe. Uh, um, yeah, the main use case, yeah. uh, as it will turn out. And maybe uh, in a year, a couple of years, um, plans have to be made and uh, someone ha has to tell them, and them being uh, the government, um, that there are alternatives to uh, just put money on Microsoft. Yeah. Which yeah. Then seems to be default. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 those are the default yeah. for one So the, the question is serious, and uh, maybe there is some business to yeah. be done. But the top people in Norway don't know about anything else. They're not very um, insightful on these matters. So somebody has to tell them that. So a the, few things. So first of all, I think that the problem is with Microsoft Google, as I said earlier, with the Cloud Act, that's not really a solution. Right, because it's still like the data is still out of your control. And there's this other thing that if your government, okay, this sounds a bit weird because we have the same problem in Germany, by the way, but if your government cares about Norwegian business, then maybe go to a local service provider, work with a, service, a local service, IT integrator company and deploy open source software there then this would be better not only for privacy and security, but also for the local economy, in my opinion. Um, so, it, yeah, <laughs> they just don't care. <laughs> yeah, they, they have basically thrown all the privacy away the last years anyways, so... That's, yeah, yeah that's a problem. I, again, I know this from lots of discussions, but even if you don't care about the privacy, okay, fine, whatever, but then just becoming, giving up on your software industry and just becoming a Microsoft customer. I don't know if this is a good economic decision for a country. But and I can comment also, the last time I was involved in some, yeah, for the education sector, uh, with the school Linux and other uh, Stuff using Linux, um, cheap versions of these, Microsoft just threw away all the software for the schools. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they, they're going to fight this. Absolutely. And Germany went the same, like during the Corona times, they gave away free licenses and, and now they're sending out the first invoices. Um, <laughs> It's like a truck dealer, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh. 
some other feedback or questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's more, it's more of a technical question. Um, how is maintenance of the software nowadays? Because uh, things need to be updated and kept uh, yeah. to shape, uh, especially since it's all like overwhelming and server yeah. bugs or soft no, security issues are in there will be <laughs> devastating. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at least uh, running things like that at home, then uh, having uh, automatic updates of everything is uh, more or less a must. It's, uh, but, but I think when I've tried before, it's not really like a no-touch thing. Um, yeah, and, and, and whether it's a, like a GIP separation or configuration software, or if everything is a bit... Well, wouldn't that be really a matter of your your package system? Yeah, uh, exactly. So it depends a bit how you deploy it. Um, mm -hmm. So if you if you deploy the the Docker container or the Ubuntu Snap package, for example, then it just updates basically more or less automatic. Um, if you use like the the native basically zip file from the native installation, then the current state is still that you get a notification, a push notification that there's a new version version available, <coughs> but then you need in the menu you need to say okay I want to update it. We haven't implemented like automatic updates yet. That's definitely something that is needed. You can see this from the WordPress history, right? Where you have like, yeah, people are lazy to an update, and then you have outdated, unsecure versions, and they're all hacked, and then that's a disaster. Mm -hmm. So this is why WordPress has implemented this like automatic updates for emer uh, for, for in, uh, emergency security problems, and we will have to do the same mm -hmm. at some point. At the moment, you still have to manually click, but. Um, okay. We have to, we have to do that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but isn't it in the distributions, packages, and systems? So uh, yeah, those versions will not be updated by the distribution, or won't they? Sure, but I mean, I don't know which Linux distribution does like package updates automatically. Oh, you mean yeah? Uh, no, most Linux users often. Uh, personally, I like my, my updates to come when I ask for them. I want to update myself. Yeah, but that's now. what we have at the moment. Yeah. 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 But I think most distros can be configured to do it, but uh, yeah. the yeah. default is off. Uh, Ubuntu more or less do uh, security updates if you want them or not now, I think. I think they do just do it. Uh, I try to turn it off because uh, on, on an Ubuntu system, but it still uh, still updates behind the scene. But then it should have to argue with this guy over there. Emergency updates. <laughs> They're sneaking in. <laughs> oh, it's went on sometimes since I tried next level last time. So it has yeah. definitely grown uh, since I tried it last time. The updating um, is still the same. At the moment, you still have to, you have to click it. But yeah, yeah. But, uh, but if I but if I rely on the the native package from the the OS, then yeah. al also between version, it's a sort of a no no touch thing. Yeah, we it's we're looking into that, and we're a bit paranoid how that we really want to try this right, because. There are two possible problems with automatic update. The first is if we do a mistake, then uh, we could like kill all Nextcloud servers in the world, which uh, <laughs> would be a bit bad. <laughs> Send everybody, hey, please execute this shell command to rescue the That's very nice. And the second is also the security thing, right? So if we are hacked, or I don't know, I'm whatever brainwashed by the sun, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> then also like we would have the power to change all next lots in the world with one, that's a bit, a lot of power. So Basically back to one, yeah. one provider again. Sort of, yeah. Just running on. There's just a lot of power that I don't think it's good to have. But, yeah, I don't know, the, the problem is real. I mean, if we, if we do, we could, you could scan the internet for next cloud servers. 
And um, yeah, we can already see today that there are several, uh, lots of outdated ones out there, which is a problem. So. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. So uh, a technical question. So if you, if I already got um, an open, um, open connect. Um, ID authentication, a user database in OpenStack Keystone, and a lots of lots of S3 compatible storage. Would that work for me to integrate easily with this infrastructure? So what did you say? S3 compatible storage? Yeah, in the back end. That support. I have a user database in OpenStack Keystone. Um, that's OpenID Connect. Or some yeah, you have to authenticate uh, through. Uh, is it called Open ID Connect or something? Yeah. But Open Connect ID, whatever. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah, that's also supported. Yeah. Yeah. That will work. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you have the university back on board. You already got it, probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what you need is like you need some Linux or BSD machine. Then you need storage, which can be some file system, some local storage, NFS, or some object storage, which is S3 or Swift compatible. And then you need a database, which is usually MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, something like that. If you really, really want, also Oracle, or, <laughs> or if you really have a tiny server, then also SQLite. Um, but yeah, and then it's recommended to have a Redis, for some caching, and then you want to have something for user management, where you use all like LDAP Active Directory, some over ID Connect, some Shibboleth, something. So I can't use my Keystone database. With my key, I, I have to Google, but Keystone, Keystone supports Open ID Connect or Thermal, I think, right? I, I need to research that, but I assume so. And then it works. Yeah. Can can uh, uh, Nextcloud be my OpenID Connect provider? No, we, have, we don't have a, we don't have a provider okay. yet. I mean, we are a provider for our own clients, but that's... Yeah, but I was case. thinking for other services. Yeah, no, no, it's... Yeah, I thought about it, but it's a bit too much. So, we have our own user management built in. So, if you just want to have like 10, 20, 30, 50 users, you can just configure them directly in Xcode if you want. But we are not an IDP in that way. Anything else? I haven't really talked about technology too much. I mean, back end. <laughs> All these um, all these parts that you recommend, like the, the software, web server, mm -hmm. Redis, etc., are all those packaged in the, the Docker images that are provided? Yeah. yeah, Docker has everything packaged. So even a database? Yeah. Well, you want to store it outside a Docker image, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> we have these two conflicting interests. One, um, there are some people who come to us and say, hey, is it available in Docker? And we say, yes, great. Then I deploy it in my Kubernetes cluster. And Kubernetes idea is that you have all these microservices, of course. Right? Yeah, we want to have your storage, your Redis, your database, your configuration, your application, your IDP, your blah, 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 blah. And for that, you have, want to have split everything up in lots of different components. And then we have other people who come to us, yeah, I want to have like one Docker that I can run and then everything is ready. So we have a bit of a different conflict of interest here. At the moment we have sort of both. I think we have two different Docker containers and one is more for the splitting up into individual pieces and the other is more the all-in-one. Well, but what if you have all the all-in-one, um, everything disappeared when you when you update to a new container, right? It's I'm not a full expert, but there is some there are some sub containers which then has the storage which then survive if the application is updated. Okay. I 
and you could probably be body, map a volume to the the yeah. base followers. I love this. Yes, but then uh, mm -hmm. if the version changes, then. I guess it does a transform, database transform on the at Um <laughs> We have my knowledge ends there a bit, but there is some work to be done for which tries this, not, not tries, which solves this problem, which will be released in four weeks, which should, um, it's called Nextlog All in One. It should be the combination of both requirements. So you can update the different components because there are some sub-containers for Collabora Online and for storage and database, but it still can be deployed with one single command somehow okay. because it's automated. How this exactly works? Yeah. No, 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 but this is what uh, reduces maintenance to the yeah. bare minimum. It's the idea, yeah. yeah. Installation, you want put everything in one Docker image. Yeah, yeah, this is for this is for the testing and, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is for the use case that someone just quickly wants to run it on whatever their Synology or some other thing with one command. That's not for the that's not a real cluster setup. <laughs> Questions. I think I'm over time anyway. So <laughs> well, I guess it's getting, getting close to beer time though. <laughs> <laughs>